got uh, just a, a short introduction um, and then we'll, we've got six speakers lined up for the evening um, to talk about timber, earth, straw, hemp, lime and natural fibre insulations. Um, we're going to have a, a short two minute break halfway through so you'll have a chance to, um, to have a loo break. Um, and then at the end we're going to break out rooms um, which will give you a chance to just ask a few questions and um, then we'll come back at the end into the, the main room for a final summary and a few announcements, so stick around. Okay, next slide please. Right, um, ACAN, just to introduce ACAN a little bit for those who aren't aware. Um, it, ACAN is a, an Architects Climate Action Network. It's an open voluntary network of individuals in the built environment industry. It uh, started about uh, in April, about two years ago, well, two years ago um, it, by a small group of architects trying to address the lack of climate activism within architecture. And it's now grown to a global network of over 3000 people. It started with a vision for how we could work and autonomously as a collective of individuals in order to make rapid decisions and respond quickly to the climate emergency. Next slide, please. Um, so ACAN's main three aims are to decarbonize now, um, ecological regeneration and cultural transformation. Um, so uh, I'm going to, I'm going to um, move on from this, but basically the, these are uh, the, the overarching um, kind of aims that we aim to do and to, uh, with everything that we do. Next slide, please. So I'm going to start with an overview of what's wrong with the construction industry currently and um, giving you a few pretty harrowing facts. Um, currently we use vast amounts of brick, concrete, steel and plastics in, in the industry. Um, so let's start with why this is bad. Next slide please. Concrete is the second most consumed substance on the planet after water. Embodied carbon in construction is responsible for 15% of world greenhouse gas emissions. Human made mass has now reached over 1 trillion tons, exceeding the entire biomass of the natural world. Two point four billion bricks producing two point six billion kilograms of CO2 emissions are now used in the UK each year. Meanwhile, an estimated 2.5 billion bricks arise as demolition waste each year, with only 5% reclaimed for reuse and the rest re crushed for fill. Thirty two percent of UK landfill waste comes from the construction and demolition of buildings and 13% of products delivered to construction sites are sent directly to landfill without having been used. But it doesn't have to be like this. <laughs> Designers, builders, planners and clients are all complicit in prolonging the use of those conventional methods and materials. Now is the time to question our legacy and build with natural and local materials, which can be part of the climate, part of the solution to the climate and ecological crisis. So buildings can be made from renewable sources, contributing to regenerative land management. Next slide, please. Regenerative land management restores ecological habitats and soil health. Next. Whole new industries will be created and existing industries transformed as we move towards a low carbon, more resource efficient economy. Natural building materials typically have a low embodied carbon, requiring little energy to process or make. Over its lifetime, one tree can sequester around one ton of CO2. Building with plant-based materials stores carbon and stops it re-entering the atmosphere for the lifespan of the building. Using non-toxic and vapor open materials that regulate humidity, helps to maintain healthy indoor air quality. Natural materials are part of a continuous life cycle, 
they can be easily reused, recycled or safely returned to the earth. So how can we change the industry standards to use natural materials? Well, next slide. We started by uh, starting a natural materials group within ACAN. Our aim as a group is to make natural materials the first choice for building elements in construction. We want to do this by providing concise and clear resources that are easily accessible. Next slide, please. We aim to do this by um, asking people what they need, um, looking at resor what resources already exist, filling in the gaps and formatting information for different user groups. Part of this outreach of information includes events like this, which is being recorded and will become part of our online resource. We're also launching this evening a survey, which um, is part of our research, um, and that's to better understand the current limitations and opportunities that are out there. And we'll share a link on that in the chat box um, towards the end. So what natural materials can we actually build with? Well, well, there are many, many materials and we're not able to talk about them all tonight, but we will be doing a whole natural materials event series um, every month, hopefully for the, for the next year at least. Um, and tonight we're gonna to give an overview of just six main sort of categories of earth, timber, straw, hemp, lime and natural fibers. So we're gonna kick off uh, these, uh, these talks. We've got six speakers lined up, as I said, and we're gonna start, if, next slide please. Um, we're going to start with uh, Tabitha Binding, who is from TD UK, Timber Development UK, and she's going to talk to us. Next slide, please. About timber. Over to you, Tab. Thanks, Jana. Much appreciated. Um, it's uh, never know if it's nice to go first or second. So yeah, as Jana said, I'm um, Tab Binding. I have the joys of going first. And I know we've got a lot to get through, so I'm going to jump into it. May I have the next slide, please? And timber. Ah, I suppose it's quite obvious, but it grows on trees. And to a maturity, a tree can take tens to hundreds of years. Next slide. Timber grows from the inside out, starting at the pith and adding a layer of early and then late wood annually, often known as growth rings. As the tree ages and the trunk thickens, the sapwood, you can see it there on the uh, middle diagram, um, um, which is the living part of the tree, turns into heartwood um, because it's no longer needed to carry nutrients. This heartwood is basically dead, um, um, but it is often durable and it is the strength within the tree. Next slide, please. So trees sequester carbon. Se sequestration occurs through the process of photosynthesis, whereby trees exploit sunlight to combine atmospheric CO2 with water to produce carbohydrates that become incorporated into the body of the tree. And oxygen is released back into the atmosphere. The amount of carbon sequestered depends on the species, but typically one ton of dry wood contains 500 kilograms of carbon. I said it the opposite way around to Jana. This tonne of wood will have absorbed approximately 1.8 tonnes of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Next slide, please. So there's two, two main groups, softwood and hardwood. And the hard and the soft do not relate to the density or durability but to the seeds. Angiosperms, which are hardwoods, have a covered seed, while gymnosperms or softwood have naked seeds. Softwoods are often grown on plantations with the rotation starting at around 40 years. They're mostly evergreen with needle-shaped leaves. There's around 650 species, of which about 60 are in commercial use. 80% or more of timber used for construction in the UK is softwood. Next slide, please. Hardwoods or angiosperms are mainly deciduous, but some are evergreen. They're broad-leaved, 
and there's around 50,000 species. There's around 2,000 in commercial use and most have a specialised end use. Next slide, please. So when people refer to timber, it's a bit like them saying, you know, fruit or vegetables. You need to get more in depth with that than that. You need to um, specify a species. Um, and if you go to the TRAD website, they have 150 species. And here I've just put like the A to Y, not A to Z. Um, and just go and click on those and it will give you all the basic information that you would need. Whether you're looking for the strength or for durability or for stability or for density, for appearance or resistance to wear and impact, to ease of coating and performance of coating or resistance to chemical attack or insect attack. Next slide, please. So timber products. As part of a thinning process or on maturity, trees are felled. And if you see the diagram on the left hand side there, you can see that's a, a conifer and you've got the butt log, the middle log and the top log and then the crown, crown and the branches. So these are felled and taken to a mill and processed where the majority are sawn but some are peeled and chipped. The recovery of solid wood from the round log is up to 70% of the volume of that log. And that sawn timber from that 70% from that is often called the core products. The slab wood, the sawdust, and any other bits that come off it are known as co-products and often get chipped, and maybe going to other products, or turned into energy to power the mill or the kiln which is used to dry the green timber. And if you just see the diagram on the right, which come from Trada, you see the log, it, when it's turned into sawn timber, it can be used just as sawn timber. It can become a, um, an eye joist or a metal web joist. It can be nailed or glued or um, brecht apple, which is um, joined together with beech dowels. It can be chipped and turned into OSB, or it can be peeled into thin sheets, which can be turned into plywood or LVL. And unique among, I think, all the um, products um, are eye joists because they can be made of uh, many of the different products. Next slide, please. So timber in the UK, this is the consumption back in 2019, 16.79 million uh, cubic meters. The vast majority of softwood, you see very little hardwood, uh, you know, hard, um, particle board and OSB, which we're using even more of nowadays, fibre board and plywood, and very, very few veneers. Next slide, please. And where does it all come from? The vast majority comes from the European Union, a little, uh, you know, uh, followed by the UK, and then a little from all those other countries. But whenever you're specifying and looking to um, buy timber, always look to find that it has a certification behind it. And this will show that it has been sustainably managed and that more trees will be planted when it is felled. Next slide, please. So timber and moisture um, are really important. Often people think fire is the most um, a problematic thing you'll have to do with timber, but it's actually moisture. Um, we, we see um, most of the problems that we see tend to be to do with moisture. So growing timber, the growing timber is full of moisture, but when it's held, this moisture decreases rapidly from the cell lumens or the cavities within inside those cells until they are empty. When they are completely empty, this is known as fibre saturation point. Then more slowly, the moisture um, evaporates from the cell walls. The loss of water from the cell walls causes the timber to shrink. And to prevent major shrinkage in use, timber should be specified to a suitable moisture content for its end environment. Next slide, please. So timber is hygroscopic. It absorbs and it desorbs moisture depending on the ambient temperature and humidity. And shrinkage is predictable. If you look at the diagram on the right hand side, um, it in general does not shrink along its long length, that's on its longitudinal, and it shrinks twice as much tangentially to radially. And if anybody specifies cortisone, 
they're going to find it very difficult um, to get hold of. It is an extremely expensive operation to do. And there's two quarter sawn bits. You can see to the left, say it's at nine o'clock and at midday, I suppose, and at three o'clock, all that timber has shrunk very predictably without cupping or warping or um, rhomboiding. And then you see there's a, the, the edge board up at the top, or they're often called the falling board, that often goes for cladding. And you want to put the piss side out so it always cuts in that direction. The diagram on the left, I'm sorry, it's a bit small, is the equilibrium moisture contact curves for wood. And this sort of gives you good guidance on specifying the right moisture content for where you're going, the end use of your timber. So if you're, if you're going to say internal in a house, it's 20 um, degrees centigrade. The relative humidity, you'll want it to have it between 40 and 60 percent. So you'll look, be looking to specify your timber about 11 or 12 percent moisture content. Next slide, please. When specifying timber, choose a species that suits its end use. So you need to look at its use class and its durability class. Where are you going to use it? Is it going to be in interior and covered and dry? Or are you going to actually be building in salt water? That will enable you to choose the right species for the right place. Because we want the timber that's taken so long to dry to last as long as it's taken to grow. Next slide, please. So old timber. Timber we've been using in constructions for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And so on the left, there's Greenstead Church in Essex, thought to be over 900 years old, based on its, um, I can never say this word, dendrological testing. And just on the right, um, a nice crook framed, um, this is the red line in Hereford, dating back to the 14th century. Next slide, please. And then engineered timber, we're into now the, um, the glue lamb and the CLT. Completed in 2019 in Norway, Moschnet is the tallest timber building at 85.4 metres tall. It's 18 storeys, but the, but the ground floor is concrete. Next slide, please. And then we have large timber. Dalston Lane stands at about 33.8 metres tall at its highest point. It ranges from five to ten storeys. By building in timber, which is light in comparison with concrete and steel, 35% more homes were able to be built and 589 less deliveries to site compared to a concrete building of the same size. Next slide, please. I wanted to say small timber, but actually I looked at the footprint and it's actually quite large for uh, um, a single storied house. Um, I'm going to challenge you to go and look up Larch House. It is a fantastic build. It, it, yesterday it won the Passive House Trust Award for small buildings and it is almost completely timber. Go and have a look. Next slide, please. Timber and fire. I mean, timber burns, but it chars as it burns, and this slows down the rate at which it does burn. Um, talk to good fire engineers, uh, follow all the guidance. Um, we've had buildings um, in timber for hundreds of years. Go, you know, go, go and have a look it up. Next slide, please. But do we have enough timber? Um, and this is what people often ask. So this is what they mean about annual increment. You see the slide on the left, you have the stand of trees that are currently growing. They have an annual growth rate. Often then you have an annual felling. So take the annual felling from the annual growth and provided you're not felling more than the annual growth, you will have an annual increment and we will be having more trees and therefore probably more timber to use. But please, learn about it, understand it, and use it wisely and well. Don't overuse it. Thank you, Jan. Thank you very much, Tab. That's, um, that's fantastic. We're gonna move straight on to Earth, Earth Building, um, which uh, we are gonna have introduced to us by Roland Keeble. He's from EBUKI, which is Earth Building UK and Ireland. And I will pass straight over to you, Roland, if you're ready. I'm ready. 
All right, over to you. Uh, yeah, hi everybody. Um, so, uh, thanks very much, Tab, for the introduction to Timber. I think one of the things that I wanted to kind of get across is that all of these materials um, are not competitors. They work extremely well together. And the idea that kind of grew up in the 20th century that um, <clears throat> we had the silver bullet that could answer all questions um, in the in the shape of a bag of cement can do floors, foundations, walls, uh, roofs, ceilings. Th this this is now over, and all of these materials um, that we're talking about today um, are going to be more relevant or less relevant on a particular site in a particular condition, um, <clears throat> depending what it is, and that they work very well together. This is. Um, just a slide showing the sale of buildings made from earth in England and Wales um, in the early EPC data era. Um, and I just show it because um, I think a lot of people feel that earth is something that is, um, is, is old and irrelevant and doesn't relate to them and they don't know what earth is and maybe it's going to be good somewhere else um so uh just to say actually a lot of people live in these houses there's quite a healthy market in the sale and rent of existing buildings the large majority of which are probably more than 100 150 years old yes next pl slide please and so um, I'm putting up a couple of quick slides to answer questions which I get every single time. Um, one of which is how high can you go? And so uh, on the left is a housing and uh, business development in Lyon, which is about 200 years old. And, and one in Germany, which is <clears throat> also about 200 years old. Um, they're both in urban contexts, they're quite high, and so they are sort of the opposite of what many people think of or think that they think that earth building is about, rural and low rise and all rather spread out. Next slide, please. Um, so this is a housing development in Germany and it um, is very largely timber, but um, in the common parts, it's very largely earth. And so the earth is being used um, here to um, it deal with its, you know, to bring its best qualities forward in this situation, which is fireproof and soundproof. Um, so it, it, it also has a lot of thermal mass. And so it's being used for those qualities uh, alongside uh, a timber frame. Next slide, please. Um, so these <clears throat> three images um, I took on the from the map that I have on my wall, uh, which is a soils map and is basically uh, a discussion about supply chains. Uh, and I showed this to a group in South Wales recently. So the top left hand corner is um, soils map of England and Wales. And then because we were teaching in South Wales, we go a little bit closer and look at the variety of different um, geologies uh, present there. And then the main picture, I've gone a little bit closer again, just to show you the range of different geologies and therefore materials that are available. If you're standing in a yellow bit, then you don't have uh, whatever is in the blue bit. And if you're in the blue bit, then um, you're not that far from the material that's in the gray bit, but it's actually not under your feet. And so these give you uh, indications about how far material might be traveling if you're bringing it, uh, if you need a particular um, uh, uh, sand or clay from, from somewhere um, uh, nearby. Um, but essentially this is just a guide and what you actually need to do before you start thinking or planning a building is to go and dig a hole. So we call that a site investigation and it's a very normal thing but um, 
typically it's about telling an engineer what the bearing is um, on the site. But for us, it's saying there's this kind of clay, there's this kind of sand, it's in these kind of proportions, at these kinds of depths. And it's a, just a handy guide to begin uh, thinking about what sort of earth building you want to do because there are different kind of earth buildings and some of them use more aggregates and some of them use more sands and some of them use more fibers and some of them are in Wales where it rains a lot and some of them are in East Anglia where it's much drier and so there are all of these different variabilities and you're taking a lot of these things on board when you're thinking about this supply chain. Next slide please. So um, two different jobs. These are about 20 miles apart and they're both in Sussex and you can see that um, they're extremely different um, uh, to each other and what's coming out of the hole and they would lead to quite different approaches in construction. Um, on the left hand side is a very fine soil which would lend itself very well to brick making um, or to cob construction or to framed earth and on the right hand side is um, chalk where the chalk has met clay in the in the geology in the landform and um, produces a material called galt which is kind of related to chalk and it's also strengthened by clay and uh, lends itself to rammed earth and um, uh, possibly also uh, cob or mass earth. So looking at under your feet at your site is a really good place to start because that also means if you can use the material on site that you're looking at the site not as a flat place that you're going to build on top of with a lot of expensive materials that you brought in but you're able to think about terracing and uh, changing the landform because it will not only bring you the materials that you need for the build, but also because you can, and that's quite an enjoyable and interesting way of um, improving your design without incurring a lot of cost. Next slide, please. Um, but then you might just say, look, I've got a site. It's all ha got to happen tomorrow. Could I have some materials, please? And um, this is HG uh, Matthews in Buckinghamshire. There are many other um, uh, plants around the country producing uh, particularly plasters, but also blocks. And I think that this is something that we're going to see the growth of in the next, uh, you know, in the coming years, that people will want to be taking material from their site and having, them, having it processed um, in a facility like this, rather than trying to do it on site, but also that these sites exist where there are good materials which are known and tested um, and you can produce a, uh, a, an output which is you know comes with a certificate and all those kinds of things. Next image please. So um, you know I mean I felt sorry for Tab because like talking about timber there's just like so much to talk about and you've got 10 minutes to try and sort of squish it all in and earth is is kind of the same. Um, here you've got from from left to right on the left hand side is a turf building, um, next to that is a stone and clay mortared building, um, below that a framed earth building and on the right of that a rammed earth building and then a, um, a cob or mass earth building and below that molded earth bricks and blocks making very sort of funky non uh, orthogonal shape and finally on the far right a uh, a light earth structure which is related to framed earth but um, gives very different k values in the mix which is put in between the timber structure um, so there's this whole family of of materials um, clay is not always the same there are different properties to different clays and there's this whole family of techniques which lend themselves more or less to the different types of the material and they all sit very well together you can put uh, mass earth with rammed earth you can put uh, molded earth with framed earth you can put uh, clay mortar with just about anything um, there's an enormous amount of flexibility to um, uh, structural uses and to decorative uses 
Next slide, please. Um, decorative uses, uh, in this case, being um, a very flat, even, um, standard, you might say, clay plaster at the Apple Store in Brussels, contrasted with um, the highly textured and coloured finishes at um, basically every Nando's restaurant in the country. And both uh, situations are using clay for its aesthetics, colour, different texture, but also for the health and well-being um, that it brings comfort in the spaces, people selling you phones or selling you food want you to feel as comfortable as you can because they know that they're going to be able to sell you more um, of whatever it is uh, that they've got if you're feeling uh, if you're feeling well. Next slide please. And so this is uh, brings us on to kind of health and well-being um, from these materials. Um, and you can see on the graph on the left hand side that at 50% humidity, then it's quite difficult for bacteria to, um, to grow, for viruses, yeah, we, we know what they are. And, and, and these things mean that uh, if, you, if you can reduce those kinds of uh, things, you get, you're getting less molds, less fungi, it's improving conditions for asthma sufferers and allergy sufferers. And all of this gets done by clay, which can um, adsorb as well as absorb uh, humidity from the air. And we've also seen quite recently that um, clay can sequester VOCs. And so in, um, uh, in a time when you're getting more and more uh, tightly sealed buildings with things like formaldehydes in them, um, that holding onto VOCs and not letting them circulate in buildings is quite important. Um, yeah, so I mean, the air quality in London is typically worse indoors than it is outdoors now. So uh, this is this is a reflection of, of what's happening. And with both of these things, the, um, the management of indoor humidity and the management of VOCs and also the use of mass to store heat and cool. These are all aspects of the materials which are inherent. They just do it. You don't turn them on and you don't turn them off. Um, can I have the next slide please? Thank you very much. Thank you, Roland. Thank you very much for that. Um, we are going to uh, now move on to straw. Um, and to talk about straw, we have uh, Phil Christopher. Um, Phil is from the SBUK, uh, which is Straw Bale Building UK, but he's also um, part of Huff and Puff Construction. Um, but I think he's wearing his SBUK hat today. I'll pass straight over to Phil, if you're ready. Brilliant. Thank you, Jana. That's fantastic. Um, yes, that's it. Here for uh, Straw Bale Building UK today. Um, uh, over there at uh, gatorstrawbuilding.uk. You can see the website there. Um, yeah, brilliant. I mean, it's lovely to, to have um, timber and earth, first of all, because as um, Roland was saying, all of these materials work very well together. And especially with straw, we tend to use um, quite a lot of uh, earth in, in straw construction, certainly a lot, of, uh, a lot of timber as well. So, so first of all, I guess, what is straw? Um, and first of all, uh, it's to say it's not hay, um, which is a, it was a food material and is going to sort of break down a bit faster. If you want to irritate a straw bale builder, then start calling it hay. It happens all the time. Um, so it's certainly the, um, it's basically the dry stalks of the cereal plants that we grow, you know, pretty much everywhere in, in the UK. So we're looking at things like wheat and oats. Um, sometimes people use barley. Barley's a bit soft. I don't really like using barley personally. Um, but uh, yeah, winter wheat is probably a good one to go for. Um, and it's useful, I think, to think about it as being similar to wood, you know, so it's got that sort of cellulose content. If you keep it dry, it's basically going to last uh, forever. And it's, uh, it's an agricultural byproduct. Um, so 
we obviously want to take the grain uh, from the, the wheat or whatever it is that we're harvesting. And then what do you do with the straw? And it's used for, for lots of different things. And we'll touch on that in a, in a second. If I could have the next slide, please. So yeah, why would we want to build with straw? So we can see a lovely uh, straw bell wall here. Well, first of all, as we're looking at with all these different things this evening, it's gonna help us with the, the climate crisis. We can store carbon because that straw, just like wood as it's grown, has stored some carbon inside it. Um, it's a truly sustainable material and it's often very, very local. As I said, we're gonna find straw uh, in most places in the UK. So just as Roland was talking about with earth, uh, we've got very good accessibility to straw across the country. So there's no reason why that straw couldn't be very, very local to where you're building. And yes, all of these things are gonna contribute, contribute to the, the circular economy. The, the straw that we're using in the building is obviously, you know, a very uh, non-toxic innocuous material that you're going to be able to um, either put back into the ground at the end of it and, and you've, you've got a, a regular yearly supply um, of that material coming out that we could be using so we're not actually depleting um, any other resources apart from what we're able to grow from the ground every year. So the main thing about straw of course is it has a really really good insulation value. So we're going to say that the, the a straw bell wall will generally have a U value in the range of 0.1, somewhere with the with the lower, uh, the better. Um, normally, much better than you'd have with a, you know, the standard the cavity wall, and much better than the regs demand. Um, there's lots of work going on at the moment, um, as part of the um, interreg up straw project, which has been looking at urban and public buildings made out of straw, um, challenging the idea that straw buildings are just a a rural thing, uh, a bit like Roland was talking to, to us about with the, with the earth buildings, um, and showing us that we can have straw in lots of buildings uh, in, in lots of different sorts of uh, types of uh, ways. Um, there's certainly, you know, you, you can you can design straw bell buildings with incredibly good uh, scores for what are needed to, to be able to, to 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 meet the demands and the and the building regs. You can easily have them cement free because you're looking at looking at using different sorts of, uh, of, of uh, foundations and, and different things that we can use. They can be zero carbon in construction and in use. And you're not necessarily looking at, the, at them being any more expensive than other buildings uh, to build, and they could save you money longer term. Um, and we can you know, use them for all sorts of buildings. So what we're looking at here, which we'll look at in more detail in a second, is using timber in conjunction with the straw and, and doing that, then really the, you know, the, the, the sky's the limit. Um, so looking at the amount of straw that we're using each year, there's, there's lots of varying figures on this. And this is something where we're waiting for actually a lot of the outputs from the uh, upstraw project uh, that's going on at the moment, because there's some fantastic research that has been done there. Um, and we'll be signposting that on the SBUK website as it becomes available um, so that we can find all this new data that's come out um, about straw building um, in the UK and across um, Northwestern Europe. Uh, so that we can share that and find out uh, what we can do. So certainly we could say that there's enough to build a quarter of a million or say all of the houses that we build every year, we could be building them out of straw. Um, you know, so, so somewhere in that region, even if, even if there was enough for 50,000 houses, it would be a tremendous amount more houses than we're building with straw um, at the moment. Um, one thing that uh, people commonly common ask about straw is of course, uh, you know, will it, burn will it go up, up in a puff of smoke and it's interesting um, going back to what Tab was saying about um, timber uh, straw is very much the same in, in the way that it will if you've got a straw bale wall like you can see there um, it would char on the outside of the wall it would take a very 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 long time indeed uh, tests have been done that take us into you know hours I think especially with rendered surfaces um, so you know it's uh, like setting fire to a phone book people say you know quite often it's it's, it's a difficult thing to to, to burn so it's, and a lot of these things I think with with most natural materials can seem sort of quite counter um, intuitive with with the way that we've been brought up to think about other materials now but actually they do stand up and work really really well the only enemy of straw really in construction is moisture so that's the thing that we have to be careful to make sure that the design takes into account um, and that can include things like working on the air tightness and other elements of the building um, but generally, uh, you know, the straw that we're using in buildings is going to have, when it goes in, it's going to have a moisture content of 15% or below. And we're not looking at increasing that 
Um, but I think you've got to get up to about 30% moisture before you'd see any degradation. So this is certainly something to think about uh, during the construction phase, uh, because if you've detailed your building well, that's the only point where really the straw is going to be able to get wet. Um, so that's just something to think about. Um, and that uh, as long as you do that and, uh, and finish it properly, then it should stay there for a very long time. Next slide, please. And nuances on the different things, but we'll look at the, 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 the main categories. Uh, we'll look at the main categories of how to build with straw. Um, so first of all, we'll look at load bearing straw bale buildings. So, so here we actually have the straw uh, supporting uh, the, the, the wall plate above it and the roof above it, or indeed the stories above it, but potentially. Um, quite often what you'll see with this approach is um, you'll see some sort of timber at the top and bottom of the wall. Uh, and then uh, the straw will either be pre-compressed uh, with straps or indeed the weight of the roof could come down onto the straw to compress the straw. Um, and that will hold everything very, very firmly in place. And you often get this sort of eureka moment where <laughs> people find that actually it's not all going to fall over and it's actually just an amazingly resilient wall. Um, quite often you will find some timber, as you can see there, framing uh, doorways and windows and different things. And you can basically put as much timber into that wall um, as you want. You'll get to the point where um, uh, we'll go on to once we uh, look at infill, which we'll look at next. Um, there's um, there's lots of different nuances and different ways that you can do this. But basically, the straw can take the weight, a, a really tremendous amount of weight, which is good to know. Uh, next slide, please. So, yes, yeah, so the second method is infill, and this is basically where we're going to use some sort of frame um, in order to be able to insert the straw into. And again, there are tremendous different ways of being able to do this. Um, the way that we tend to build quite a lot is uh, using something which is very similar um, to the load bearing approach, but we use more posts. Um, you can then make a timber frame, which you can then uh, insert the straw into. Going back to the, the points about moisture, it's quite important and, and, and very important and useful to be able to make your frame, um, put the roof structure above it up to weather tight, and then to be able to insert the straw underneath in the, in the dry, because it's certainly building with straw bales on site, it takes quite a lot of um, area and space to be able to process all of that straw, um, especially if you've got a number of people, um, to be able to get it into the get it into the walls and you want a nice dry space to work in. So with the infill approach, then that can still be um, a, a structural element of the building, or it can just be the insulation that's sitting there as well. So uh, quite often you'll find that if, if nothing else, the, the straw is performing a, a sort of a racking function within the wall, um, but it could just purely be the insulation and, and, and the rest of the structures taking care of everything else. Um, Again, so similarly with the load bearing approach, you'll, you'll have some timber around that straw to hold it all in position and uh, you're potentially going to make sure that it's compressed so that it's going to be, you know, a nice robust uh, airtight wall. Um, if you've got, for example, a, a timber post and beam frame, then quite often you will set um, the other timber elements on the outside of the frame, uh, just so that it doesn't compromise the movement of that of that frame. But again, lots and lots of different ways to do infill straw bale. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so the final thing to look at is the, um, oh, was that the next one? Can I go back one? Oh, sorry. Oh, I put the same picture in. No, that's fine. Thank you. Um, so yeah, just talk about um, hybrid straw. Um, so, uh, so basically, Again, like we've been referring to so far, there are lots and lots of different ways um, that, that straw can work with other products. Um, quite often you're going to find that straw bale buildings will have uh, clay plaster internally, lime plaster externally. You can also use timber for cladding on the external side of, of straw. Um, so there's lots and lots of ways that we can use all of these different bio-based materials, which are just, um, you know, obviously fantastic and something that we want to see see more of. Uh, one of the most exciting um, sort of innovations that we're seeing now coming through um, more and more is straw panels. So this is working towards the sort of the 
modern methods of construction and uh, panel construction and factory produced construction materials. Um, so, so looking for the benefits of those things. Um, and again, this is useful with straw because potentially you can um, create those panels in the dry, um, bring them wrapped to site and, and get the building to weather tight very, very quickly. Um, we did some research um, here in Dorset back in, in 2017, where we looked at the availability, the regional availability of local of, of, of timber um, and all these different materials. And, and timber we regarded as a, as a regional resource. Um, we definitely had straw very locally available. We had all the materials that we would need for um, earthen and lime plasters and renders available, and of course the local labour. So we're looking at all of these materials coming together um, to really, um, you know, give us, you know, that circular economy and the and 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 using um, all of those different things that we can have locally without having to go too far afield, um, and being sort of self-sufficient um, in all those different things. So you could potentially have all the different housing that needs to be built or estates of housing, you could be literally producing that very, very close to where it's going to be do, going to be required, as is the case with so many of the materials that we're talking about here um, this evening. Um, yeah, so that's great. All done. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is going to be Will Stanix, and uh, he is going to introduce us to hemp. Um, Will's from the Hemp Block company and he's been doing lots with uh, hemp for a long time so um, lots of different things as well so Will if you are ready um, yep then yeah okay great over to you okay uh, thanks Jana um, hello everyone there's a lot to fit into 10 minutes so forgive me if I move quite quickly um, hempcrete is the woody chopped up stem or shiv from the industrial hemp plant mixed with a lime binder and water and it creates a low density insulation material. The lime and hemp are mixed in varying ratios to achieve different densities and therefore different strengths and different insulative standards depending on what you're using it for. The hemp predominantly, the hemp we use in the UK predominantly comes from the UK but also France and the rest of Europe. Uh, the lime binder also comes from the UK, France or some other European countries and they're specifically formulated for use with hemp. I won't say too much about the lime because you've got a speaker talking about lime next. Uh, next slide please. Because the aggregate in hempcrete is plant-based or a bio-aggregate, you can quite easily create better than carbon, better than carbon zero buildings. Uh, as we've heard earlier, earlier with timber, hemp does the same. The hemp plant will absorb and lock up lots of CO2, which you then lock up in the building for the life of that building. You can actually lock up more carbon in your building than you emit producing materials and building it. So your home or building becomes a carbon capture system. Next slide, please. Hempcrete's main application is in walls, but it's also used in, in solid and suspended floors and as roof insulation. It's predominantly non-structural and is usually used in conjunction with a timber frame, but really any structure can be easily adapted to uh, take hempcrete insulation. I say it's predominantly non-structural because it does hold itself up and the, finish, and the finish is attached to it. It provides additional stiffness to the frame and in cases such as solid floors, it does take the imposed loads upon it. It can be wet cast on site in shuttering around the timber frame it can be sprayed into place and it also comes as blocks or prefabricated panels. It's very versatile as you'll see from the next few slides. Uh, next slide, please. Cast hempcrete, as you can see, you can see in this slide, is the classic form of hempcrete. It's mixed in a large mixer and poured by hand from bucket into the formwork uh, and the formwork is attached to the timber frame. The frame usually sits in the middle of the wall, but equally can sit at either side. In the picture on the left there, I'm using reusable shuttering, but you can also use OSB for shuttering, as in the bottom middle picture. And you can also use permanent shuttering in the form of a breathable building board, such as wood wall board. The hempcrete walls are on the right, um, that's the finished hempcrete, and that will just get lime rendered on the outside and lime or clay plastered on the inside, and that's your wall three layers and you're done. Next slide, please. 
Uh, this is sprayed hempcrete. Uh, the details for sprayed hempcrete are very similar to cast. You still have a timber frame, but you only have either temporary or permanent shuttering on one side, and the spray machine projects the hempcrete against it. The shuttering can be as simple as hessian stapled over the frame. You spray it from the outside, then the next day go inside, take the hessian down, and spray the rest of the wall from the inside, and you're done. The machine delivers dry hemp through a central hose and a wet lime slurry up another hose, and they mix in the air as it's projected at the wall, and the resulting hempcrete sticks to whatever you spray it at, especially your van, if you accidentally do that. Um, next slide, please. Hempcrete blocks are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, again, you have a timber frame or other frame, could be a steel frame or a concrete frame or something like that if you wanted. And you build the blocks up with lime mortar and tie them to the frame using stainless steel frame ties. It's uh, the easiest way to build with hempcrete and requires no specialist skills or equipment. The blocks work very well with a feature oak or glue lamb frame. There's an oak frame in the bottom left and glue lamb top right. Uh, the blocks can be as large as three or four hundred millimetres wide so that you just plaster the inside of them and render the outside. If you're worried about cold bridging um, through the mortar, you can use an insulating mortar or have two skins of blocks and stagger the joins. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is a hemp panel house, so prefabricated house. Uh, for this build, we simply built structural cassettes from timber, filled them with hempcrete, dried them uh, and delivered them to site where they were erected uh, a three-bedroom uh, three house uh, in five days. Next slide, please. This is a recent build I did in Dartmoor where we used hempcrete blocks as the internal permanent shuttering and then sprayed from the outside. This gave us the instantly dry internal environment to, to plaster straight away, coupled with the air tightness and speed of construction that sprayed hempcrete gives you. So as soon as we finished uh, spraying, the windows could go in and we could get on with the plaster inside while the sprayed hempcrete dried to the outside. Next slide, please. Uh, roof insulation. Uh, we use a lower density mix for better insulation where the strength is not required. Um, it can be cast sprayed blocks or dried loose fill insulation. Here we've got low density blocks laid out on the roof and then we're using a, a, a dry loose fill hempcrete to fill in the gaps. Next slide, please. Solid hempcrete floors or hempcrete floor screeds use a denser mix to achieve greater compressive strengths and to take the loads imposed on them. Again, they can be cast sprayed or blocks laid on a lime mortar. Uh, in the floor on the right, I've set timber into the hempcrete to because uh, eventually a timber floor will get fixed to it. Uh, many people are a bit dubious about hempcrete floors and they do need uh, good detailing, but the one on the right there is uh, over 10 years old now and it's, it's still doing fine. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is solid wall insulation. The picture on the left is uh, the inside of a stone cottage in the Cotswolds. I've sprayed 150 millimetres of hempcrete internally um, as solid wall insulation. Uh, due to the nature of spraying, it's very easy to maintain the curves and features of the original building. There's no fixings, there's no cold bridges, just a continuous 150 mil layer of insulation, which will then get just get plastered over. So you can turn a, uh, you know, a building with not much insulation at all into a very nice, cosy building. The picture on the top right is a similar stone building. It's in Guernsey, but this time I've used 80 millimeter blocks uh, and they're in they're fixed internally and they're fixed back to the masonry with um, uh, wall ties, as you can see, like the ones you can see in the bottom right hand picture. Next slide, please. Uh, using hempcrete in old buildings is actually or often cheaper than using conventional materials. I've done lots of infill panel projects with, with cast, sprayed, uh, and also blocks. Uh, with cast and sprayed, an internal frame of hazel or sweet chestnut stakes is installed in the panel. Um, I think you can see it, sort of see it in the bottom left there. 
uh, around which the hempcrete is then uh, cast or sprayed and neatened up before um, plastering or rendering it. Next slide, please. Once your hempcrete is complete, you need to finish it. And the golden rule here is to use breathable or vapor permeable materials. Externally, this means uh, a lime render or cladding with a ventilated gap or masonry um, with a lime mortar. The middle picture there is my own house. See my cladding there. Uh, the middle picture is my own hempcrete house. Top left is showing one of my lime renders besides a natural stone. And uh, that is, they're, they're both over hempcrete there. Um, next slide, please. Internally, you need to be using a lime plaster or a clay plaster. Uh, these three pictured here are all naturally colored clay plasters that I've made and used in hempcrete houses. For the left and the middle plasters, I've used a uh, hemp shiv instead of sand. And on the right, I've used straw for increased tensile strength. Um, I'm a big ad advocate of texture plasters and plasters containing fibre um, when using them in a hempcrete house. I'll talk in a few slides time about breathability and hempcrete being able to absorb and desorb moisture from the air in your home, creating a healthy constant humidity. But the hempcrete can't do that if your plasters don't allow it to. Uh, if you use a lime plaster with sand and hard trowelet to a very tight, smooth finish, it will be breathable, but it won't give your hempcrete as much access to the moisture in your home as a textured plaster or a plaster containing fiber like hemp or straw. A textured plaster has far greater surface area to transfer moisture through and fiber within a plaster creates lots of little pathways for moisture to travel along. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as this slide clearly demonstrates, hempcrete houses are very comfortable and warm. Uh, I'm enjoying that hempcrete wall there. Uh, hempcrete is quite unique for insulation. It's not as lightweight as other insulations, and so it provides both insulation and thermal mass in one. Because it has thermal mass, it can store excess heat from the building. It can also give that heat back to the room when it's colder, for instance, when the doors or windows have been open. This helps maintain a more constant internal temperature. With lightweight insulations, your heat is stored in the air, and as soon as that, as soon as that air leaves, uh, it's gone and the heating has to kick in again. Hempcrete helps maintain a steady indoor climate, acting like a giant battery bank of heat. Because, because of this, hempcrete out, outperforms its U-value, uh, sort of its on-paper U-value, it will outperform this. Um, and this was very evident when I built my house. Uh, I was told by my energy assessor software that I would need uh, X amount of heating. And in practice, we can go a whole winter without using the central heating, uh, just relying on solar gain. And when it's very, very cold, a small amount of wood in the wood burner. So if you are thinking of a hempcrete house, don't chase U values. The building regs minimum or a bit better is fine because you will, you will find that it, it does outperform. Uh, it's, it's on paper U value. Next slide, please. Just as it acts like a thermal battery for your home of, for heat, hempcrete does the same with moisture. Like many natural materials, it can absorb moisture from the air in your home when it's very humid, and it can release that moisture back to the room when it's very dry. So it buffers humidity and keeps it at a more constant level, which is very good for anyone with asthma or breathing difficulties. And this, by the way, is why your finishes must be vapor permeable or breathable so that moisture can travel freely and not get trapped in the wall. It's also very good acoustic insulation with both airborne and impact sound. It's fire resistant, durable, and can create very airtight buildings, even to passive house standards if you so desire. Next slide, please. Um, hemp is not just used in hempcrete. From left to right there, it's used in plasters and mortars. Um, hemp and clay materials, as in that hemp clay block in, in the top. And the cladding there are cladding boards made from hemp fiber, not the shiv, the fiber mixed with a natural resin. I believe it's a corn starch resin. Um, next slide, please. 
Uh, and that's an introduction to hempcrete. Uh, pictured here is the biggest hempcrete building in the UK at Bradford University. That was hempcreted by Graham Durrant. And bottom left there, probably the smallest, which is a kitchen extension in Sheffield that I designed and built over 10 years ago. And you can pretty much use hempcrete for anything in between. The very cheesy picture on the right is the first time I ever removed a shuttering board on a hempcrete build in 2008. And I think it says a lot about the material that I'm still an advocate for it 13 years later and living in a very healthy and cheap to run hempcrete house. Thank you very much. Thanks, Will. That was really, really uh, lovely. I mean, great to hear the birds in the background as well. I enjoyed that. <laughs> Um, we are going to have to um, just let everybody know that we're probably going to run over our, our time a little bit. We're running behind. We, we had a late start because of technical issues, so I'm really sorry about that. Um, and we've also gone on a little bit with some of the talks, which uh, I think everybody is enjoying it. So that's great. But um, we will move swiftly on to Lime, which is going to be introduced to us by uh, Simon Ayres from Lime Green. Simon, are you ready? I am ready. Yes, thank Excellent. you. Over to you then. Okay. Right. Um, so lime is a little bit different to some of the other materials we've seen so far in that I don't think it's really classified as a natural material. It's something we've used for thousands of years and you can look all around you and you can see old bridges like this, um, ancient structures of all sorts. Um, and it's proven to be very durable, but I don't think it's truly a natural material. Of course, it comes from limestone that we dig out of the ground, but unlike earth or the straw or the hemp, it, we don't grow it, you know, and we're not making more of it. Um, so, but I'll explain a little bit more about it and why I still think it's relevant and useful um, uh, for this talk. Next slide, please. So lime is made by heating limestone in a kiln to around about a thousand degrees. So obviously that's quite energy intensive. Um, and what that does is the limestone uh, uh, releases carbon dioxide as, it, as it's heated up. And you get a material called quicklime, which comes out to the bottom of the kiln. That quicklime, um, when water is added, turns into one or two materials that you may or may not be familiar with that you'll find in builders merchants or, or specialist suppliers and that sort of thing. And it's that lime that comes out of the bottom that we mix with sand or water to make a lime wash or a lime paint. We'll mix it with sand and other aggregates to produce the sort of plasters and renders that Will was just talking about um, or that we might use on some of the, uh, the other structures we've seen earlier. Next slide, please. So here are some lime kilns, older lime kilns on the left and in the middle, slightly newer ones on the right. Um, they are in fact probably only 50 years or 80 years apart in age, but you can see that heating the, heating the stone to a thousand degrees quite, takes quite a lot of fuel. It doesn't take quite as much fuel as heating uh, limestone and clay and other materials if you were producing cement, so cement is produced out similar stuff, but it's produced in a different way and it takes more energy to produce cement. But the difference between cement and lime is that lime will reabsorb some of that carbon dioxide when it sets. So that's quite an important aspect to remember, but it's, it's not wildly different. You're heating stone up quite to a high temperature. Next slide, please. Um, so lime's been used for thousands of years and it's kind of been superseded in the last 150 years or, you know, it, it's been superseded by cement, which was invented 200 years ago. It's been superseded, lime plaster has been superseded by plasterboard and, and so on and so forth. And we've introduced these uh, more synthetic materials, these more um, uh, uh, plastic based materials more and more recently and these materials are the polar opposite of the kind of 
thing that you get with lime and the materials that lime likes to work with. And I'll explain a little bit more what I, by what I mean by that in a moment. Next slide, please. So why lime is important, despite it perhaps being not as uh, green, if you like, as some of the other materials, is that lime is a protector and it helps us um, when we're using some of these other natural materials to produce a lime wash, which you might use over a, a, a clay or earth plaster. Um, you might use a lime plaster inside or outside. And importantly, it has this protective effect, a little bit like outdoor clothing. So it sheds water, but it also allows moisture to, to evaporate through it. So it allows water out, um, but it reduces the amount of water coming into the product. And that's really important because it, it ha it's, a, it's a bit more robust than some of the other materials in terms of its ability to stand up to the environment that we live in, particularly in this country. And it, it helps protect those slightly more um, delicate uh, natural fibres, um, earth plasters, earth buildings and that sort of thing. And it works with them. And that's the important thing. Whilst it might not, it might use quite a lot of energy to produce it, it's this breathability as, as, it's, as, we, as we call it, uh, or vapour permeability, and it's relatively low uh, compared to some other materials, capillarity, um, that make it useful. Next slide, please. So why that's important is because when, when we get it wrong, when we use um, uh, products like cement and other um, materials like that on traditional buildings to renovate them or on new buildings which are being made out of the same sort of uh, materials, you can end up with catastrophic uh, results. And uh, moisture trapped, so using materials that don't allow moisture out, can mean that moisture accumulates in the structure, uh, timbers rot, uh, natural fibres uh, rot and that sort of thing, and you end up with things basically falling down or you end up with an unpleasant internal environment. As a quick guide, if you look on, on the left there, um, if we look at the mu value of different materials, this is basically the vapour resistance of uh, different materials, um, uh, the higher the worse it is. And so you can see lime render down the bottom about 10. Uh, as an example, um, a natural insulation, something like sheep's wool or wood, wood fibre insulation, and that some of these other materials have a, a value of about five. Okay, so that's better still. Uh, soft stone and brick, 20. Uh, concrete, about 100. Um, uh, basically, foam plastic insulation, uh, 300. Um, uh, lime wash is out, out of, kill, out of uh, place in my scale, but um, it's five, so it's very low. Uh, masonry paint, 300. So when you get up into much more than 20 or 30 or that, something like that, you can end up with problems. And particularly, you would have problems when you are reusing a building or renovating a building because you're using, they're built differently and you're using materials with much higher mu values, you're gonna trap moisture. Same goes for newer buildings with uh, uh, built out of some of the natural materials. Next slide, please. So a quick example, I don't wanna uh, um, uh, uh, go on too much about this because I'll, I'll uh, spoil the next um, talk, but it's an example um, of lime render. So the lime render is very specific uh, in this case, and it's designed to work with the wood fibre boards, which are over a timber frame building. They're built to a passive house standard, and the lime render is there to protect the boards, to protect the structure, um, and keep it uh, looking good for a long time. And although we've been using lime render for 5,000 years, you know, it can be a very durable material if the right mix is used. It can be extremely durable. We're, you know, it should last decades. 
in the right hand, which means that it's protecting these natural materials for decades, obviously with maintenance, which is allowing us to use them. If you were to swap that with something that was vapor impermeable or had a mu value of 300, you'd be trapping moisture in these buildings and they wouldn't last nearly as long and there'd be an uncomfortable internal environment. Next slide, please. So in a similar theme, lime plasters used inside, although not in the, not in the quite the same way as externally, because then obviously not protecting against the uh, wind and rain and that sort of thing. But lime plasters inside uh, can help with moisture regulation. Um, in particular, they're, they're high pH lime plasters, mortars and renders and that sort of thing, which means that they're an unfriendly place for stuff to grow in them. So particularly lime wash, the old um, uh, uh, thing about people lime washing their houses or buildings regularly, that is actually for good reason. It's not just to place, keep place click and ban, it's actually for good reason. And if you look at lime is still used in farming now to kill stuff uh, um, in cattle stalls and that sort of thing. So it's a very useful material um, without resorting to biocides or other nasty chemicals that you might use in more synthetic products to do the same sort of job. Next slide, please. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. That was really informative um, and uh, a very, very useful uh, material lime, even though it isn't quite the same as some of the other natural materials, mm. but um, it is critical to use. Um, so thank you. Um, we're gonna move on to natural fiber insulation, um, which is, almost as um, broad as timber, I think. There's a, there's a lot to get in here, but we um, are gonna have a summary of this by Chris Brookman, who is from Back to Earth and uh, has a wealth of knowledge to share. So I will pass over to Chris. Are you ready, Chris? Yeah, I am. Thank you very much. Great, um, you. The great thing, of course, about going at the end is that everything that you were gonna cover has already been said. So um, <laughs> I'll try and pick out the, uh, the salient points. Um, okay, so natural fibre insulation, also called natural and renewable fibres, um, certainly our definition would be you know, fibres that grow, so they would be um, plant fibres or animal fibres, um, and also products that are mechanically processed but not chemically processed, so there are various natural fibres that undergo a lot of chemical processing to turn them into something different to what they, they naturally are. Um, but all of the fibres that commonly are used in natural fibre insulation are essentially in the same form that they were in uh, in the plant, give or take a bit of, uh, a bit of mechanical processing. Um, the main products that we use in the UK are uh, hemp wool. So that's made from the, the hemp fibres that wrap around the, the stalk of the hemp plant. So uh, the other part of the plant that, um, that Will doesn't use in his, in his hemp crate. Um, sheep's wool, obviously made from, from sheep's fleece. Uh, now this, currently farmers get nothing for, for fleece. So actually sheep's wool would be quite a, a beneficial product to use because it would actually uh, return a lot of um, finance back into, into farming and make sheep farming actually worthwhile. Um, the other product, which to be fair is, is more my forte, um, is wood fibre and wood fibre makes up the main bulk of, of natural fibre insulation. Certainly in Europe, it's about 60% uh, and I would imagine it's something pretty similar in the UK. Um, and essentially you take waste wood, it's all the, the offcuts, the bits that can't be used for lumber, for structural timber, um, small trees that can't be used for anything. Uh, all of that's dried, it's then ground up between two big plates and then uh, turned into a, a loose fiber and then formed into either bats, so squashy insulation bats or into rigid boards. Uh, the other one would be cork. So that's made from the periodic um, uh, removal of the bark from the cork oak. Uh, that's then uh, formed into, into boards and slabs. Uh, straw, as, as we've already been through uh, quite a lot there, um, from cereals, uh, that's probably the least processed actually out of, out of all of the fibres, so it's basically taken out of the field and, and used straight into the building. So in terms of embodied energy, that's probably got the lowest out of everything. Um, and then the other one is, is cellulose, so that's largely made from recycled paper, um, uh, any sort of newsprint essentially. 
uh, ground up, formed into a fiber, and, uh, and then it's blown into timber frames. Uh, next slide, please. Um, okay, so as I said, all the fibers require different levels of processing. Um, they are all what you would call low embodied energy materials, but there is quite a bit of variation between them. Um, and certainly some materials, you know, wood fiber being one of them, particularly the wet processed wood fiber, does actually use quite a bit of energy in its manufacture. And the embodied energy from manufacturing is actually you know, quite significant. And given the enormous scale of, of manufacture of synthetic materials, actually the, the manufacturing energy can be lower in synthetic materials, but it's really the carbon that these products lock up that makes them so beneficial. And that's where they, that's where they really win. Um, so yeah, in, in spite of the economies of scale, most of these materials will be considerably lower embodied energy than any, any synthetic materials. Um, the actual fibers, all of those fibers that I've mentioned, all those products are all biodegradable, recyclable, compostable. Um, a lot of LCAs, actually life cycle analyses, um, include the burning essentially of the product at the end. So they're assuming you can't recycle it and it's just going to get burnt. Um, but all of those products, except straw bale, uh, actually use a binder of some sort. And it's the binders that make them a little bit less green if you want to be purist about it. But um, so a lot of the, the wools, so the hemp wool, sheep's wool, wood fiber, uh, flexible wood fiber, they all contain polyester fibers to bind them together. Um, and certainly some of the boards will contain uh, polyurethane based glue. So um, to be completely transparent about it, all they're not all pure products. They do need to include some, some synthetic products to make them useful. Um, next slide, please. So how are they used? Uh, again, largely very, very simple. Um, the, any sort of uh, bat or roll product like sheep's wool, uh, hemp or, or wood fiber comes in a slab or, or a roll and you just simply push it between timbers. So that's, that's extremely easy. Uh, the board products such as wood fiber boards or cork boards are generally mechanically fixed to the outside of a timber frame. Uh, you can render onto them, you can clad over them. Uh, you, in the case of the wood fiber and, and cork, you can put floors on them. Uh, they're, they're quite versatile, they can be used on roofs, they can be used just about anywhere. So really, really useful materials. Um, next slide, please. So essentially, in terms of where they can be used, you can use a natural fiber insulation nearly anywhere that you can use a synthetic material. Um, so the only places you can't are anywhere that's going to be permanently wet or regularly wet. So um, roofs are fine. Roofs don't get permanently wet. <laughs> um, walls, suspended floors, ground floors, and you know some solid floors. But generally, below ground, where you're going into basements and things like that, you, you would tend not to use them. Um, and certainly, masonry cavities as well uh, are not ideal situations for uh, um, uh, natural fibers. The, the moisture content in those situations tends to be too high. Uh, and over a period of time, you would slowly begin to, to rot your fibers. Um, as I said, the, the, boards, um, the board products can be used in, in solid floors. The load bearing capacity is variable depending on which, which product you're using, but anything between about 50 kPa, which is similar to you know, the cheap white polystyrene, up to sort of 270, 280 kPa, which is you know, really hard stuff that you can, uh, that's 28 tons a square meter. So it's, it's a huge amount of weight you can put on it. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so moving on to wood fiber, I'm, I'm going to try and catch up some time here to <laughs> go through it reasonably quickly. Um, these are just a few examples of wood fiber. So the, the sort of bottom left hand corner and the top right, you can see a flexible type of wood fiber product. If you look closely, you can just about see the, the white fibers of the polyester that's mixed in with the, with the wood fibers in those products. Um, the other, all the other layers that you can see are wet processed wood fiber boards, which actually are made much more like paper. So you, you grind up the wood fiber in a, in a watery solution, you lay it out in a, in a 20 mil slab on a, on a sieve conveyor belt, um, and you steam it and the steam actually melts the natural lignin around the fibers and sticks it all together. And then you just glue those layers together. So although those products do have higher embodied energy, they are arguably 
greener because they didn't contain any um, any glues. Uh, next slide, please. So typical constructions are a few um, with wood fiber, but equally you could use most of the other products. You could use cork and sheep's wool in, in this just as well as, as the various types of wood fiber. So this is a flat roof construction. You've got a, a wood fiber board on top of which is the lighter brown. Uh, the darker brown would be the, the zone between your joists, uh, which you can use with any of the, any of the flexible fiber materials. Uh, and so you can do unvent, unventilated flat roofs. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, there we go. <laughs> uh, that's a, a sort of an eaves junction. So again, you're you're using the timber frame, uh, using a timber frame structure, using the timber frame internally. Uh, the darker areas are, are the rafters and the and the stud, uh, the wall studs, uh, and externally you've got boards. But you know we've got wood fiber here, but equally you could use um, cork in in the same location. Um, we often use OSB actually as, as an airtightness layer and certainly um, um, Durellis boards and um, the smart ply boards uh, you can get in, a, in an airtight product that you can use internally so you don't necessarily have to uh, use a, a plastic membrane for your airtightness layer uh, but that would be internally and then again you can you can use other fiber products in the service void internally um, yeah next next slide please and just a quick eaves junction there, uh, eaves junction, that uh, plinth junction even, wrong end. <laughs> um, again, so this is where we would we would generally switch to synthetic materials. So you can see on the outside of the plinth there, we, we're switching to things like XPS so that you can use these below ground and you obviously don't get any issues with, um, uh, with product degradation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so timber frame really is the ideal construction material to use um, natural fibers in. Um, timber behaves very similarly to, to all the natural fibers that we've discussed. Um, and yeah, it all works really, really well together. Uh, this is uh, a timber frame in, in its natural state, which is completely soaked because it's obviously just rain. Um, next slide, please. And here you can see the, the frame being filled up. This is all with wood fiber, but as I say, you could do that equally with any of the other fiber um, product, uh, products. So you've got the studs in the walls, they're all filled in between with a flexible wood fiber. And there's a couple of layers of wood fiber board that are going on the roof, which will then be counter battened and battened and, uh, and slated. And again, below ground, you can see that or at what is currently at the bottom of the building, which ends up below ground. Um, that again is polystyrene. So typically we'd use synthetic materials underground. Okay, next slide, please. So this is, and I know Will Kirkman's watching, uh, this is uh, a Styco invention or, or sort of um, discussion. So one of the wood fiber manufacturers has, has refined really the areas of insulation that make natural fibers so incredibly useful. So the eight roles of, of insulation really are acoustic insulation, uh, fire protection, um, health, so health of the occupants, but also health of the, the installers, uh, comfort within the building, buildability, which is, is largely a, a construction issue, durability, again, during and after construction, uh, sustainability, and then obviously thermal insulation. Um, actually, next slide, please. So natural fibers, um, well, synthetic fibers, we're very good at designing sort of one trick ponies. So we look at fibers and we try and work out the way that we can um, ensure that they let the, the least heat through, which is great. You know, that, that works well most of the time, but certainly not all of the time. Um, in all of those eight different areas, Synthetic fibers tend to really perform only well in, in one, and that would be the sort of the thermal insulation area. Um, now, natural fibers are incredibly complex. Oh, hello, Jana. <laughs> You've come back. <laughs> um, natural fibers are incredibly complex, complex products. They are, they grow in a plant. They are, when you examine them under a, under a microscope, uh, they are incredibly complex structures. Water can adsorb and desorb from them. They are fine enough to, to transport moisture huge distances. Uh, so, you know, vertically, you can transport water out of the ground and 20, 30 meters up a tree. 
Um, and because of that, they work extremely well with moisture. So in all of these buildings and everybody else has, has been discussing it as well, we really, really, really need to, um, uh, to, to consider the role of moisture and how it works within the building, how it works inside the actual building, within the structure of the building and, and obviously from, from the exterior. Um, so because of that complexity, the natural fibers just, just perform over across the board and, and make a massive difference. Um, the other thing is that these products tend to be quite dense as well. And, and the physical structure of those products has a, has a big bearing on the practicality of the, the product in terms of how you install it. Uh, and also that then moves on to the performance gap that you quite often get between uh, uh, buildings built with synthetic insulations and, uh, and their intended uh, performance and, uh, and something that you tend not to get with, um, with natural fiber insulations. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, shameless plug here. Um, we're also involved in a product, uh, in a product <laughs> a project even called BioCirc. It's obviously getting past my bedtime. Um, and it's an it's a EU funded project where we're uh, um, researching how we can uh, incorporate synthetic fibers, so waste synthetic fibers, largely polyester fibers from duvets, beds, pillows, um, which are currently just either chucked in landfill or burned. Um, they are uh, being mixed with natural fibers and, and the beneficial properties of those products are being incorporated into those, into those fibers. So we're, we're currently um, doing some prototypes and, and researching how we can incorporate that into the market. So bringing back uh, recycled content as well as, as well as natural fiber. And I think I'm reasonably on time with that, hopefully. So thank you very much. Can I, before I disappear, can I just quickly say thank you to you guys for organizing this? Because this is a massive amount of work that you've done and you're doing it all off your own backs. And it is an absolutely fantastic thing that you're doing. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to, yeah, we're, we're going to skip over the, we're not going to miss out the breakout rooms, but we just want to come back to that um, and start with um, just a couple of announcements. Firstly, thank you to all our speakers. That's, it's been a fantastic evening to have you all here. Um, and we're now, we're in a, in a moment, we're going to go into breakout rooms as, um, as promised, and we'll have a chance to hear some of your questions and we want to write down, down notes. First, I just want to announce a couple of things. Um, I know that we're running over, so I want to get these things out in case you, people have to go before the breakouts. So um, we, this is the first event of our natural materials series. Obviously, we have realised this evening that there's a lot to talk about. Um, there's a huge um, thirst for this knowledge, I think, from lots of people. So it's been really great to have everybody here but we have a lot more to share. Um, so we're going to have a whole series of events and we have, we're able to now announce the, uh, the next one we've got, which is going to be in four weeks on the 29th of July, um, Thursday evening, 7 p.m. That's going to be building with straw. Um, so we're really excited about that event. We've got lots of great speakers lined up that will be announced soon. Um, following that, we've got uh, lots of ideas for further events that um, we will, um, give you more detail on as and when. If you want to sign up to the newsletter with ACAN then you'll hear about this sort of thing every month um, so do do that. Um, we've also got the natural materials uh, survey, a target audience survey. Um, the, the link is on the screen but actually you can't click on it there so we'll get somebody to um, post a link in the chat box any second now with that survey. Um, if you could um, fill that in that would be really really helpful it's aimed at everybody and anybody but uh, we're trying to trying to gauge the um uh we're, we're trying to gauge the issues and the um opportunities that are within the, the built uh, the the industry at the moment to really um untangle what we need to work on next um we also, as a, we have a group, we are um, a volunteer network. We're made up of groups of individuals. Um, the Natural Materials Group meets generally every every week, every Thursday evening. Uh, if you want to join that, um, do drop us an email, and uh, you're more than welcome to to join. And then you can help us uh, to actually put on things like this event. And also, we're doing work on on research and resource building. Um, 
We've also got uh, a couple of other ACAN events. Uh, there's there's an ACAN event coming up just next week on the 7th um, for a the fifth instalment of the tutors workshop hosted by ACAN Education. That's one of the other ACAN groups. Um, there's nine altogether, so Natural Materials is just one of them. Do check out all the others. There's lots going on all the time. Um, and I think we'll get that link in the chat box as well. So um, that will be there. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming, for sticking with us for two and a, a long time. Um, it's, it's been a really, really good evening. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you to all the speakers. Thank you also to all the back of house people. Um, I know that was there were some technical issues at the beginning that were quite tricky to solve. So thank you for dealing with all of that. Um, and we're really looking forward to seeing you all again at the next event in four weeks for Building with Straw, which is going to be super exciting. I'm really looking forward to that one. So um, round of applause for everybody. And thanks. Good night.